Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and back there attacking a toy is Julie Oliver and she's a dog. About three and a half months ago, I made a video about a deceptive paper which had been published in a poor quality journal from a publisher known as MDPI by some Swedish scientists. The paper falsely claimed to show that spike protein inhibited DNA repair. And that paper now actually has an expression of concern issued by one of the authors. Well, now there's another deceptive paper by some Swedish scientists that has been published in a poor quality journal from MDPI. And it's also making claims about DNA. Talk about deja vu, but it's a great opportunity to show off my ABBA album again. I've actually had this record since 1975, but I digress. Let's look at this latest paper. It's called Intracellular Reverse Transcription of Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 mRNA Vaccine BNT162B2 in vitro in human liver cell line. Now, reading the paper's title, you might be forgiven for assuming that they used a cell line that bore some resemblance to the type of cells that are actually found in the human liver. But in fact, they didn't. They used a cell line known as H7. Huh? Why am I saying huh? Because H7 are cancer cells. They were derived from the liver tumour of a 57-year-old Japanese man. They are typically used for research on liver cancer and hepatitis C. And unlike normal human cells, which have 46 chromosomes, H7 cells have between 55 and 63 chromosomes. In other words, they bear no resemblance whatsoever to the cells that are found in the human liver or anywhere else in the human body. So why did the authors choose to use an irrelevant cancer cell line instead of one of the many available non-cancerous cell lines? Well, maybe they didn't have the money to buy an appropriate cell line and this cell line was the only one they happened to have in the lab. But that seems unlikely given they had the money to get their paper published in a low rank journal. If they'd used an appropriate cell line, they could have got the paper published in a better quality journal that didn't charge to publish papers. A possible reason that they used a cancer cell line is because unlike normal cells, cancer cells express an enzyme called long interspersed nuclear element one or line one for short. And if you want to know more about line one, I'll provide a link to this paper here in the video's description so you can read all about it. Line one is in fact a reverse transcriptase that converts RNA into DNA. So it's not surprising that the study would show that mRNA from the Pfizer vaccine is converted into DNA by the line one enzyme because that's what it does. But here's the thing. Although normal human cells have the line one gene, it is actively suppressed. In other words, normal human cells do not produce the line one enzyme in any appreciable amount. So what is being shown in this study couldn't happen in normal cells. But using a completely inappropriate cell line is only one of the issues with this paper. Three concentrations of Pfizer vaccine were used in the study, 0.5, 1.0 or 2.0 micrograms per milliliter. To justify these concentrations, they refer to this paper here, which involves preclinical and clinical trials of an mRNA vaccine for two influenza viruses. And incidentally, this paper is from 2017. So mRNA vaccines were already trialled in humans prior to being developed for COVID, contrary to what a lot of anti-vaxxers claim. Anyway, one of the things that they did in this paper was they compared the maximum concentration of the vaccine at the injection site muscle in mice with the maximum concentration in the liver. And they found it was 120 times lower in the liver. Based on this, the authors of the Swedish study decided to use a concentration that was about 100 times less than the concentration used in the Pfizer vaccine, which is 100 micrograms per milliliter. Now, that probably seemed quite logical to them. 
but they missed a critical part of this paper. And that is the concentration of the vaccine in the muscle tissue is not the same as the concentration of vaccine that was injected because obviously it is diluted by bodily fluids. In fact, if you read this paper, you will see that the concentration that was injected is more than 20 times higher than the concentration that ended up in the muscle tissue. So the authors in the Swedish study have given 20 times the concentration they should have based on their own rationale for the dose. It's also worth noting that the mice in this study that they think they are basing their calculation on were given a dose of 300 micrograms per kilogram, whereas the typical human dose is about 0.5 micrograms per kilogram. And that's assuming a typical person weighs 60 kilograms. I weigh a little, well, reason about five kilos less than that. So um, mine would be a tiny bit higher. And obviously, if you were larger than me, yours would be a tiny bit lower. Anyway, at a lower dose, you would expect a higher proportion to be taken up by the muscle cells. So a low amount would be available to travel to the liver. So let's look at the results. The first claim they make in the paper's abstract is that they found high levels of the vaccine inside the cells. And a lot of people seem to be getting very excited about this for some reason. I've no idea why. Obviously, if you incubate cells with the vaccine, it's going to enter the cells. That's what it's designed to do. It's no smoking gun. The next claim they make in the paper's abstract is that the vaccine affects expression of line one, which is the enzyme that can convert RNA to DNA that we mentioned previously. Strange thing is that their results say otherwise. This figure compares the amount of line one expression at three different time points, six hours, 24 hours, and 48 hours. The bar on the left at each time point is the control and the other two bars mark V1, V2 and V3 are the three different concentrations of the vaccine. As you can see, the only time there is more line one is at six hours for the highest concentration of vaccine. And at the same time point, the amount of line one is actually reduced when the lowest dose of vaccine is used. What this means is we are essentially just seeing natural vari variation or what we call noise. And the vaccine has no effect whatsoever on line one expression. This figure here supposedly shows that there is more line one in the cells with vaccine because the red color is brighter in these cells. Essentially, the red color is a fluorescent dye that binds to a protein of line one. Only problem is, the blue colour is also brighter in these cells and it shouldn't be because the blue colour is a fluorescent dye used for visualising the nucleus of cells. What this means is they have underexposed the control cells. So basically this figure is just showing poor experimental technique. Next, the authors show that the cells that have been exposed to the vaccine actually contain some DNA that has a short sequence that is the same as a small part of the vaccine mRNA. How much of the DNA the cells contain, we don't know because the authors haven't quantified it. Now, I can understand to some people this may sound a bit scary, but it's important to remember that this DNA is just hanging out in the cell. The authors haven't shown the DNA has been incorporated into the DNA of the cell. Incorporating RNA into genomic DNA generally doesn't happen but it can happen with some viruses and HIV is one of them. It is a two-step process. In the first step, our reverse transcriptase converts the RNA into DNA. For the second step, a different type of enzyme known as integrase is required. And this enzyme moves the DNA into the nucleus and integrates it into genomic DNA. Without integrase, the DNA produced by line one will just float around outside the nucleus. Or at least it will until the cell is destroyed by the immune system. But don't just take my word for it. The authors of the paper do admit that they haven't shown that DNA is incorporated into genomic DNA. Here it is straight from the horse's mouth. 
At this stage, we do not know if DNA reverse transcribed from BNT162B2 is integrated into the cell genome. Why they didn't perform the extra step to answer the question isn't stated in the paper. In summary, the study used a ridiculously high dosage of mRNA, used cancer cells instead of normal cells, and didn't even show that mRNA from the vaccine was incorporated into human DNA. So people making wild claims that this paper shows that mRNA vaccines permanently alter DNA just didn't understand the paper. If you'd like to look further into the data that I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. Thank you for listening. If you found this video useful, please hit the like button so that more people will see it. And if you'd like to see more videos about the science in the future, please hit the subscribe button.